Egal. Egal. So, um, yeah, we need to switch on monitors if we haven't yet. Um, so one of the <coughs> one of the topics um, that we need to um, continue with, of course, when we talk about clouds, because we're now in week was it twelve? No, eleven, ten. Who wants to give a guess? Take a guess. Which week are we in? I don't want to think about it. Good. Yeah, I better don't. That's a good idea. So um, exams are only in December, though. So I think I, I checked that it's on, on the website. So you have about one month between end of lectures and the exam, right? Is it? It's quite generous. So uh, don't worry too much about that bit. Um, but the point is, we only have uh, roughly uh, a month and a half, if at all, uh, before before we're done. So that's that's actually quite quick. So we're halfway through the course, a bit more than that, and we actually haven't talked about virtualization yet. Yes. In which cloud course do we get that privilege? Well, hopefully none, because we should have talked about it already, I think. Um, so um, what is virtualization? Just some intuitive take on it. Of course, we are risking again of running a bit deep into the infrastructural aspects of it, but it's still important uh, because it motivates uh, a lot of technology that, that you are going to be using, both in practice but also in assignments and the like. Virtualization? Yes, no, perhaps? Any keywords? Anything you use that relates to virtualization? Eight o'clock in the morning, virtualization yeah, doesn't go. Ah, cool. That's Wiki. Okay, Wikipedia. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's you know I, I take it as a uh, yeah um, creativity at eight o'clock. So that's good. Um, that should work. So you kind of didn't really. Did you hear about virtual memory things like this in other papers? Yeah. So kind of not the same, but uh, related in a way. So virtualization is basically a key idea of abstracting from um, um, the underlying hardware. That's precisely what, 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 what we're looking at, um, or at least in our context, is hardware virtualization, not software virtualization or memory virtualization as in other cases. So if you see in the schema on the left side, that's the conventional way you're probably going to get taught or introduced to um, how software is running on conventional machines, right? We have an operating system, no, wrong. We have a physical hardware, which is made up of diverse set of different uh, devices. Then an operating system on top of it, usually there's a layer of drivers below of it as well. So the operating system provides drivers to access particular you know, types of hardware out of the box, um, such as supporting particular uh, uh, instruction sets for particular processors, CPUs. And of course, on top of it, run the applications, right? So when applications are uh, developed against the operating system API, like Win32, or you know, um, the, 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 the POSIX API for an, in POSIX operating system, or uh, Unix operating systems, and so on. <coughs> but the idea is then that those apps are reasonably portable between you know, different uh, um, systems without actually knowing too much about the intricacies of the specific hardware they're, they're, they're running on. So point is, if you run Windows, it shouldn't matter whether you run 16 gig or 32 gig of RAM, right? So 8 gig of RAM for that matter, unless, of course, you run out of it. Um, but let's let, let, let this case alone, <coughs> then you should, your uh, software doesn't really know too much about your machine, doesn't know, uh, need to know about the exact, I come back to you, about the expo exact processor, being it AMD or Intel or whatever else, right? It would still run and still work. And this is facilitated basically by the uh, um, abstraction offered by the operating system. So yet yeah, you want to make a point there. Yeah, uh, Windows have a <coughs> RAM limit of like 128 gigabytes or something, at least on the uh, ordinary version. But yep. if you have the solo version, they may support more, although no one uses the solo version of Windows. I'm pretty sure it's basically just Linux, Ubuntu, and so on. Um, yeah, okay. So it depends on what you're referring to as server, but um, usually in within organizations, you actually find it quite a lot. Oh, okay. So as web servers, not so much, that's right. Still, and definitely not amongst the supercomputers, um, but for, for you know, file management, Active Directory, and things like this within organizations, you still find a bit of Windows Server stuff. But you're right, there are different limits as to wh what hardware is supported for reasons, but the idea is if a software you know, uh, of operates within those limits reasonably, then it doesn't really matter whether you're on the desktop version or on the server version of Windows idea, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a, a related point there. So, Coming back to the idea, okay, the operating system or particular one of the uh, core aspects of the elements of the operating system is the kernel, so-called kernel. And um, one of the proper definitions, well, well, I don't know, um, kind of a bit more popular definitions if you like of that is that it's the only program that's running at all times because it monitors 
the execution of other, other programs, it monitors hardware, false, uh, and so on. So it interacts directly with the uh, underlying hardware and it schedules applications. Because as you know, uh, capacity on all this hardware is constrained. Uh, for example, CPUs may only have so many cores, in worst case one, yet you're able to run you know, 20 applications at the same time, right? So still everything works, so someone needs to kind of allocate the processor time efficiently so that you guys can actually uh, fluently uh, operate your you know, machine. So, cool, that's the standard as we know it, all good. Right, and the idea about virtualization was, okay, um, hang on, can we, can, can, we, can we make this a bit simpler in, uh, and using a bigger piece of hardware, but actually run, for example, multiple operating systems on it, right? So, and the idea is there, okay, cool, we can actually isolate complete operating systems. So here, uh, denoted as VM0, VM1, and so on. So um, for different purposes, right? So one is running hypothetically web server, the other one is running some security critical application, the third one is running some database and so on. And the whole uh, system is completely separated by the means of actually replicating the structure of a complete um, CPU again, right? As a virtualized form. That, that means that it's basically virtual hardware. So hardware and software, if you like and an operating system on top of it, so Windows, Linux, or whatever else, so it actually needs to be installed again, and the applications on top of it. You guys ran this kind of thing, ish? Virtual machine, who feels reminded of something you're running publicly? Virtual box? Yes, exactly, right, similar, right? So it's a, they will see a differentiation later, but effectively it's the same thing, right? You still need to install your entire operating system in your virtual environment, yeah? It's not running out of a box, and the operating system can, of course, be different from the underlying actual operating system, right? Which is, happens to be with Windows or Linux or whatever else. So below this, this virtual uh, uh, machines, of course, we need to have some interface that allows this artificial hardware, right? This virtual hardware, virtualized mm -hmm. hardware, uh, to run on the actual hardware, right? So instead of uh, having the operating system in between that mediates it, we have something like called the VMM, a virtual machine monitor sitting in between. Yeah, and its only role is to mediate between the actual hardware and then those, those VMs. And virtual machine monitor, another term for that one is, um, so if we call the kernel of an, of an operating system that generally deals with hardware supervisor, traditional term, we could call this thing super supervisor, or we could call it hypervisor, right? So it has the kind of meta conception there that you actually are a supervisor of a supervisor. So kind of you're emulating an operating system for the purpose of uh, yeah, emul emulating an entire virtual hardware environment. Yeah? So if you read the term hypervisor, that's precisely what it describes. It's kind of an intermediary layer that manages the access to physical hardware to facilitate virtual um, uh, hardware on top of it. Kind of make sense? Just terminology, of course. We're not going to attack right now. So, um, but it's important because it's very related to what we do. And the flexibility that we suddenly have if we run multiple VMs, of course, is that we can flexibly, flexibly allocate um, hardware, right? So, uh, so referred to as provisioning. So we can say, well, you know, this machine needs a bit more RAM and the other machine needs a bit more in you know, this space or more CPU time, or we just do it demand-based. We give uh, machines some quotas with, uh, within which they can actually demand, uh, you know, more or less uh, um, um, capacity of the underlying hardware. For example, we feel that there's number crunching happening, so VM1 gets simply more CPU time. Suddenly, CPU time we wouldn't be able to provide if we were to distribute the actual hardware that we bought over individual machines, right? Because they wouldn't be able to borrow capacity from other machines. But suddenly, we have this benefit that, um, um, of, of doing precisely that. So suddenly, we can put all the resources into one VM, and then, you know, in the next five minutes, we can distribute it again across all of them. So very ad hoc, hoc very flexible. That's one of the major uh, benefits. And it's, of course, it's attractive if you're running you know, something that's uh, uh, quite grunty, like, uh, you know, uh, kind of mainframe style um, system um, that allows you to, you know, that you invest in and basically put at the discretion of your entire organization and then you run different VMs people can, can work on. So um, that's a very traditional view of uh, virtualization, uh, but it, uh, it kind of highlights the principles there, right? So it's really about emulating hardware by definition. So, and then, you know, building your new operating system on top of it. Okay. What we saw just now, or what I motivated just now, was on the left side here. So that's hardware, hypervisor, you know, the super supervisor, and then the actual VM. The VM, again, consists of the operating system, of course, libraries, system libraries, and so on, and the applications that you actually deploy, right? So, um, so one of the other aspect, aspect I didn't mention is um, for, 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 for hypervisors or for this 
um, for the sake of the guest operating systems, the hardware is fairly standardized. So there's an advantage as well that uh, from an operating system point of view, uh, it is in principle reasonably straightforward to optimize uh, uh, drivers, for example, for the underlying virtualized hardware. Because unlike in your machines, where Windows needs to, or Linux or whatever else, needs to accommodate a wide diversity of underlying hardware, right? Both in terms of uh, size, manufacturer, abilities, uh, you know, think about wireless LAN cards and, you know, all the diversity that you have. It's kind of really a kind of wild mesh. Sometimes a bit more surprised that everything is somewhat running. Um, but here it's a lot easier because the hypervisor has a fixed interface of virtual devices, right? So it has a, a, a network card of a particular manufacturer and so on. So it's a lot easier from the operating system perspective to optimize against it. Okay, that led aside, um, put aside then, um, so apart from this kind of very pure virtualization concept, the traditional one, which is basically just hardware, then this hypervisor thing on top of it, and then just VMs, um, there has um, also emerged a, a second type, uh, which yeah, grew out of it. And that's um, the idea there is where we have some hardware, but in fact, instead of just directly running this virtualization software on top of it, we kind of have a host operating system first. Yeah? And then running virtualization software on top of it. The idea is there that we can use the system more generically. We can actually run other services other than the virtualization on those devices as well. Right? So, um, and the difference between those two ones is referred to as type 1 and type 2 virtualization. Uh, or uh, bare metal virtualization is this one here. So where the hypervisor directly runs on the hardware. There's no intermediary operating system involved anymore. And this one here, of course, has these capabilities. Right? So and there's various solutions uh, for, for both types. So uh, famously is Zen, for example, a type 1 uh, uh, framework. Then there is Hyper-V from Microsoft. VMware ESX uh, is, falls in the left category. Stuff that falls in the right category is, for example, question? What software that falls in this category? Russian box? Yes, right, so because of the same characteristics. Hardware, host operating system, virtualization, and then stuff in, in there, right? And you also have like VMware there also. Pardon? VMware, you put it on the left, but you can also have VMware by running by other operating systems. Yep, cool. So VMware is kind of a company that is specialized on virtualization, virtual machines, right? They have and done that. Exactly. They are, they are in all, they're in both categories. So they have these EXI servers, which basically directly runs on hardware. And the idea is they have the entire organization servers virtualized completely. So we don't care about the underlying operating system. But of course, you may have come across VMware Workstation yeah. or VM Player or things like this. Uh, and they are, of course, this category here, right? Where you load an image into a uh, software. And I think they're free, right? At least the VM Player. Some of, some of them. There is a better version that costs. Right, yeah. So usually it's, it's a bit of a bit of a jump. That's why we don't necessarily uh, point towards it because it's just more pricey and it's limited in features for the free version. So, but this is of course an alternative to VirtualBox if you like. Uh, earlier, Microsoft had a concept or a thing that was called was it uh, Virtual PC? Has anyone did anyone play with this? No. Okay. Anyway, there was a very Microsoft specific thing, um, similar category here. So there's there's quite a bit of stuff out there in in uh, Mac OS X. You have um, Parallels Desktop something. Anyone running Mac here? Okay, good. Um, so, cool. Right, so problems here. Any problems by intuition? What's, what's, what's one of the challenges you see there? Just to share the resources with a primary OS. Yeah, okay, number one. Other issues? That's a good point, yeah. So there's a bit of a conflict here. If you run some, something else on the OS, you're kind of fighting with the you know, virtual machine. So you kind of need to get it right, right? In VirtualBox, we know that if there's load on your machine already, starting VirtualBox is not a clever idea often. Yeah? So in fact, it oftentimes doesn't run as well anyway, right? So there's a lot of additional abstraction in between because you have an operating system inside an operating system. I mean, how efficient can that be? Uh, so that's, that's one of the aspects that is you know, challenging in there. And you notice, even if you have a grunty machine, kind of, uh, you know, can be quite um, slow. Other points? Just looking at the schema. Yeah. yeah, you kind of said it, but it's like that the hypervisor there can interact directly with the hardware, but there's a hypervisor that the host operating system. There is, again, this abstraction thing, yes. Yeah. But if you look a bit up in this upper area, is there something that is a bit more, you know, confusing to some extent? Not confusing, but uh, redundant. Thank <laughs> you. 
I kind of just want to motivate to move to the third schema, so you gather it. So, <laughs> so the idea, of course, is um, so you're getting away with this because it's eight o'clock in the morning. Share but uh, sorry, do you share a lot of the same. Well, it's a pro of lot of replication, right? So you notice here, not only, of course, do you have the operating system here, you also have the operating system in the virtual machine. And worst of all, in every virtual machine. Right? Which is, you know, so that, that's, that's one of the challenges. So you have a complete operating system installed here, and you're just running web server. You're having a complete operating system installed, you're running a uh, database. You have a complete operating system installed, and you're running a DNS server. I don't know, right? So some, some different services, you're distributing the virtual machines because Virtual machines are just awesome, they're portable, and if your hardware breaks, you just take this thing and, because of software and run it on a different host, right? So you're, you don't have this thing of uh, conventional software where you need to reinstall any, anything from scratch if things go sideways. So it's pretty cool, but every time you need to still install the entire operating system. Not only it takes time, but also takes resources, but also affords um, performance uh, decay, right? Because it's yet another operating system system calls need to go through, right? If an application wants to get something from the Windows 32 API, it goes into this operation, uh, operating system, right? It's eventually processed, handed down to the virtual hardware, a la hypervisor in this case. Hypervisor translates it again to the actual hardware. So and you can see the performance goes, you know, there's quite a bit of uh, performance degradation there. So basically you kind of um, um, balance it with the idea that you can distribute the load of the entire system or the uh, hardware capacity across the all different uh, virtual machines so you can have a high level of utilization. But still, it's quite inefficient. So that was the motivation for the fourth uh, uh, kind of, uh, sorry, the third kind of um, uh, variant of uh, virtualization, which is uh, often referred to as, you know, um, application level virtualization. But yeah, it's, it's something that uh, is, it's a matter of debate. Many people ask, argue that it may actually not be virtualization at all. But what is it about? So the idea is here, okay, let's change it around. So we stick to the hardware, cool. I think we can agree with this, kind of cool, having hardware and stuff. So we have the host operating system, also sensible, I guess, right? So you need to run it on something. We have the host libraries, which is the same as those libraries, basically, that's just the libraries for now. And then we have a daemon there. Right, so, and for the sake of the graphic here, let's call it Docker, right? So it could be anything else. Let's, it's just a daemon. So this thing, what does it do? It's kind of a, um, kind of a shortcut in translating application um, um, calls from the application to the actual host operating system by providing a, um, you know, soft, um, 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 a, a kind of semi-complete operating system, at least giving the application the illusion that it's natively running on an operating system itself. Uh, meaning it on its own installation, but in fact, just handing it down to the host operating system, which in fact leads to, to the uh, situation that all those, you know, let's call them now containers, no longer virtual machines, because they don't actually bear a machine on their own, um, that they're actually running on the same uh, operating system, fundamentally. Right? So if we have a, a shared host operating system, and this daemon just translates, and we assume that all those um, 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 machines in there, for example, run uh, Linux for sake of simplification, then it wouldn't need to be necessary to actually install three Linux three times, but we just install the libraries and the applications and everything else that they need from the operating system we just hand down. Yeah. So, and that's kind of the idea of the uh, um, container-based, uh, yeah, co containers in general. So the idea to get rid of the whole machine concept, including the space considerations, I mean, how much space do you usually need if you install a virtual machine on VirtualBox? Or if anyone did it, what's your observation in terms of space consumption? Do do okay. So you, then you are already victim of a full installation anyway, right? So it's about one or two gigabyte at least, right? If you're running a Linux thing and if you run Windows, yeah, you're talking about 10 gigabyte or 15 or something. I saw it like 1.8 gig. There you go, right? Cool, 1.8 gig. So it's house. Yeah, okay, can deal with this, right? So 1.8 gig, no big deal nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, but we want to get it small and more portable because 1.8 gig, while it's not too much and it doesn't cost much to keep it, kind of ki costs quite a lot to transfer it, right? So if you want to move it from host A to host B, uh, yeah, and you want to. It's more after you do the update as well. Sorry. I think mean that then you haven't even run the update command or upgrade. That comes to it as well. You need to do that as well, right? So it's uh, another aspect that comes into it. So. The idea is to cut all of that stuff out. So all the lower level infrastructure stuff, like operating system, in fact, even 
networking and to some extent of course you need to be able to access network connectivity but managing the network stack is totally delegated to the um, um, uh, host operating system here so it's not so much an issue that you need to manage within your own vm in a way right so um and that's that's the idea of of, of containers and uh, i don't know i like this metaphor i'm not sure if it's uh, super helpful for some of you but it shows some of the issues there so virtual machines are a bit like a complete you know houses right so you have a complete arrangement uh, including everything infrastructure sewage connectivity roof and so on but containers allow you kind of to share the infrastructure as much as possible by making the flats interchangeable, right? So you're shifting it from moving from flat A to flat B, but fundamentally you're using the same infrastructure, only the internals change, right? So there's a bit of a different layout inside or different functionality, or your room hopefully looks different from your roommate's room, right? So for example, if living in the sit apartments, student housing apartments, you kind of your rooms are kind of all the same-ish, right? I say it with care, I've never list there, right? Ish. So but of course, you know, you make it personal by bringing your own inventory and setting up things and so on. And that's precisely the idea. We only care about these personal aspects, the things that actually come along, but actually don't care about the core infrastructure because they're always the same anyway. Yeah, because that's you guys invest some time learning Ubuntu, learning AppGap and all that stuff. But this is generic infrastructure that you want to be able to reuse, right? You don't want to learn the next update command for the next operating system just to run your Go web service, right? because that's not something you really care about, right? So you're more on the apl application level. And that's precisely what you can do with containers. You only care about this what's relevant, basically deployable code, and let the uh, Docker daemon or uh, whatever uh, container solution deal with the lower level aspects of it. Um, so that's the metaphor here. And how it's done, or what was the key motivation, uh, one of the aspects was facilities of Linux in particular. So it was very much um, a Linux uh, capability that enabled the use of uh, containers uh, as they are nowadays and uh, in Linux there was a concept of C groups that had been introduced has that been talked about in operating systems or like C groups yes cool yeah what are those for the rest of the class does anyone remember isolation of memory yeah kind of isolation of everything right so uh, that's the ideal uh, um, solution but right so it's control groups and the idea was there we can assign different control groups, different pa access to different parts of the, you know, um, um, you know, hardware, for example, of the operating system, right? So CPU time, to memory, network, and storage. And um, if you if you um, dealt, for example, with um, uh, CPUs or task managing and so on, you notice that, for example, tasks have individual process identifiers, right? PIDs, right? But even those can be. Um, um, are totally isolated between those different control groups. So uh, in a Linux system, you can set up different control groups and then have s multiple times the process ID 50, right? But they are different for the different control groups. So it's a perfect example of the isolation that they actually don't interfere with each other um, as well. So, and that of course extends to uh, host names, file layout and so on. So and that's precisely the functionality that has been used uh, in, in container solutions to you know, facilitate the isolation. You're running the same operating system, yet not firstly affecting it, secondly not affecting other applications running on top of it. So that's one of the key ideas and the basis of uh, Docker in particular. Okay, so um, so much about virtualization, I don't want to go too deep, but here's again an overview of the solution I mentioned before, some of them, and some of them will jump to you because you, it's kind of super obvious, right? So VirtualBox, I think it's a good example for you to kind of get a good um, 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 uh, intuitive understanding of what, what type 2 virtualization is, right? This is kind of desktop -y, uh solution, but it's actually not true. In fact, you can also have server-side uh, virtualization that runs on an additional operating system. So there's a lot of... Um, solutions that kind of sit in the middle where they still run it on Linux, but actually it's more like a type one virtualization because you're not doing anything else on it because Linux is so flexibly used um, for this purpose. Okay, Docker. Did, I, did anyone play with Docker or had to play with Docker? Yes? Which paper? Hmm? Which paper? Which course? Um, uh, operations. Yeah? From Oslo. Okay. Next semester. Okay, cool. So that sounds um, yeah good. So what what did you guys do there? Just to get a few uh, web servers and databases. So you, you set up everything using Docker already. Yeah. Ah, that will be fairly boring for you then. So, uh, but anyway, the, the today I'll just give an intuition and then I have some other um, things like run-throughs that are provided videos so you guys can ignore those conveniently, whereas the others shouldn't. Um, but I want to get, kind of get the motivation across what Docker is about and how you actually 
how I actually use it. Um, what's your impression of your bio experience? Something, yeah, you would use, or something uh, annoying? It's very useful if you combine it in a docket form. It's very easy. Right, yeah. So, so what is a docker swarm? You manage many docker containers. Yeah. You run interface. Cool. It's yeah. a bit difficult to start with. It's yeah. Making docker docs so was not that intuitive. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, sounds good. So there, there are some uh, advanced uh, candidates already. So it's pretty good. So it seems Docker kind of penetrates the, the environment already. So one of the basic Docker is the container solution right now, right? So I think there's no way of getting around it. And uh, one of the key things is that uh, uh, you guys will probably starting um, in a sooner, sooner or later um, to provide your um, deliverables in some sort of with some sort of Docker file to run it actually, right? So it will not so long, so much longer be. Well, it may still be involved, but not like a, a bash script that basically sets up stuff or compiles stuff for you. But in fact, you probably put it in a Docker file because it's a much more generic way of actually executing and uh, deploying um, solutions. So here it's really uh, gearing towards the actual deployment, actually running stuff as opposed to just compiling it and then hoping that it runs, which is kind of the default approach. Um, so Docker principles, simple stuff. Um, it should be able to si simply, well, you should be able to use it si uh, quite quite straightforward um, and should be reasonably simple. Um, again, the idea of um, containerization builds on the idea that you have a shared operating system, so you want to minimize um, um, external components, so you really only put what you need in there. It al also leads to smaller images, one of the key things. Um, you have kind of an ecosystem around it. Uh, yeah, Docker Hub, I'm not sure how hot that is uh, anymore. There's various um, 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 kind of stores right now where you can get containers, uh, pre-configured containers. So it's kind of the equivalent to GitHub in a way. Um, and of course, you have a so, sort of element of uh, modularity where you can structure um, applications for different purposes. Scalability, performance, security, I don't know. Yeah, security is a bit of a debatable element there. But, um, and it basically allows you to decompose your application systematically. And that's one of my arguments for programmers to think about Docker as well, because suddenly your application design matters, right, when you think about the deployment. So you kind of, if you think ahead a bit and see, okay, which components, for example, can I easily replicate without breaking my system, and which ones can't I replicate, then uh, it, it's good to consider this early and then also encode this in your, for example, Docker configuration, because that's precisely what you can easily do there, spin up multiple containers and suddenly your web front end is kind of, you know, um, um, duplicated or, um, Whereas your backend is probably not. So those kind of aspects play into it. So from a from a um, application development, from an architectural point of view, it's quite valuable. And of course, there's uh, some layer based approach. Uh, committing seems to be um, the thing to go um, for, like we know it from the versioning systems anyway. And similar here, we can also commit on existing containers and incrementally build them um, using the commit thing, um, yeah, commit idea. So okay, so. Well, that's what's, what's the difference, basically, uh, virtualization, again, just to con contrast it to Docker, because that may be a discussion you may have with someone saying, well, Docker is not virtualization, or Docker is virtualization, so you kind of need to pick your battle there um, and, and make up your mind on your own. So I encourage you to read up on it, in particular in Docs itself, to get a better understanding. But in essence, virtualization is basically operating on hardware, that's the key idea. Um, and um, um, it basically you know, separates both software and hardware, whereas Docker, it's mostly operating over uh, user space, right? So um, it, it shares some uh, operating system functionality, but the uh, user space for execution of your services, applications, and so on is somewhat isolated. That's the key idea. And the isolation works on the very same host, but of course it relies on an operating system that supports that. How is the Windows support for Docker nowadays? Do you guys it's have it? Huh? It's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good nowadays. Uh, because I haven't played with this, on, uh, kind of n few people play with it on Windows, I guess. And it was really a nightmare before. I remember when I used it first, you kind of need to run it in VirtualBox or something like this. Or, or it was a very weird configuration because you need to emulate the Linux uh, uh, API in order to run stuff on Windows. Um, good. But um, so the idea is to get, you know, reasonably wide support, but still you need to have an operating system that is actively supported by Docker in order to get all this functionality, right? So then you can have isolated networking process IDs, mount systems, and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, what are possible risks of using those container solutions? Recalling the schema I showed you before. Uh, 
or what's the advantage of a few full virtualization solution over Docker from the conceptual understanding that you... More specialization. Sorry? More specialization. Specialization? Um, which one? I'm just throwing out the guess right now. Okay, uh, that's good. Yeah, guesses are welcome. Any other guesses? Uh, well, one thing is, if you run uh, Windows Docker, then like in the basic form of Windows Docker, you can only use Windows of the applications. It doesn't have the Linux libraries. Yeah. And also all the way around. Right. And then yeah. Windows Docker on a Linux machine. So it basically it boils down to being a s to some extent operating system dependent, right? So you, you, you're not you don't have the abstraction that you have in a virtualization context uh, that you're completely agnostic about the underlying operating system, right? Because you're virtualizing hardware, so in principle any operating system should be able to run. That's a good point. So there's still a bit of a linking to the underlying operating system, so surprise, surprise, you'll be running it on Linux, um, but I think everyone expected that. Um, other aspects? What, I mean, if we share an operating system, what's an inherent risk? If there's a flaw on the primary operating system, everything has that flaw. That's right. So at least everything is potentially exposed to you know whatever the risk bears, right? Meaning if your host that runs your operating system comes down, well your containers kind of come down with it, right? So it's, it's uh, and it extends to uh, security, of course, and so on. So there's a bit of a compromise you need to you, you need to be aware of, of course. And if you have may need to make the call whether to run it in a virtual machine or as a container, that could be one of the decision points, right? So if you always strive for efficiency and think Docker is the latest thing, uh, that's good. But if you think about security and reliability. There may be aspects or cases where you think about, okay, um, we, we, we need to be a tad more traditional. Are you good at balancing Jenga? Hmm? Are you good at balancing Jenga? Yeah, that's where it's the uh, essential the question, basically, yes. So, um, right. So, yeah, cool. So, it's 9 o'clock. Um, I just want to give a, yeah, I'll probably do a brief run through and then we let go and then we assist some people doing stuff, yeah. Um, so, I'd very, very brief because I just want to motivate you to get your hands dirty. Otherwise, uh, it's probably hard to motivate you to get your hands dirty if I just throw videos at you. Um, but of course, um, it's just good to get a, get a good overview of what's happening. So the general command in Linux to play with this, uh, and we, we get to the installation bit in a second, is kind of Docker followed by some sort of options, right? Docker is a shared um, daemon in the operating system, so you kind of need to, and since Docker requires access to your uh, operating system functionality, core functionality, it kind of needs to have super user permission. So you need to run with sudo kind of consistently. There are people in this world that switch just to root and run everything then using docker command, but those people should not be in this room. So, um, so um, it's, it's up to you how to deal with this. Of course, nobody can watch you, but uh, the default mode is run sudo docker, right? So, okay. And docker help is usually a good friend to, to actually get something, uh, something going. Um, ah, yeah, before I forget this, uh, one of the central concepts, of course, how could I forget this? Images versus containers. What's the difference? Images versus, versus containers. No? From a Docker perspective. So again? Images has a specification for one machine. Okay, that's one position. Position, other positions. It's good, it's good to... Kind of Again, sorry? Containers are running and images are templates for containers. Precisely, right? So I think that's a good, that's a good way uh, of putting it, right? So, um, so I, everyone got this? Right? So images are kind of uh, templates for actually running the actual containers. If you want to come in really from a very strictly object-oriented metaphor, you could argue that there's the class-object relationship, right? So uh, image could be a class which is actually not running. The object is instantiated and actually an instance of that very class, right? So, and that, that holds here for images and containers equally. So that's uh, one of the ideas. Okay, first thing before you run it, uh, because of course I want you to run it uh, uh, whenever really, but um, um, just a word of warning. The Docker version that's installed in the operating system is usually quite out of date and will not have some of the functionality you need. And you kind of want to work on the reasonably latest supported version, right? So that's the idea. Um, and that's how you install it. So the first thing you do is actually uninstall Docker from your current machine if you have already installed it. Uh, but instead do that one here. So now of course I'll provide you with the slides because it looks all painful and stuff. But effectively what it does, it updates your operating system in the first place, downloads some relevant libraries that it needs, and then actually downloads manually uh, Docker and uh, adds a new app key to the... Um, um, 
Docker no, downloads the key rather for 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 uh, Docker uh, for the Docker repository. Adds it to your app sources. So those app sources are used when you run up update on your operating system and pull the latest information. So basically, it adds an entry to this repository. And uh, um, um, it's the fingerprint, um, so you actually can validate that you're actually getting information from the right server. And then it actually adds the uh, proper repository. And afterwards, you just run up get update. And then now, including this repository information, this is something you only run once, right? On if you do an installation, basically. Afterwards, you will be able just getting all Docker information as well, and you can just then install it using apt op, um, apt get uh, install Docker CE or just apt apt get is <coughs> the older variant of it. Yeah, so that would be the way of of doing it. So if you have installed it before because you want to play around with this, I recommend uninstall it. Install it this way. This way you have the the latest version. So. And the uh, basic idea is that you have some sort of commands, right? So um, usually you're centered around Docker, surprise, surprise. Um, they allow you to search in images, possibly uh, load some down of them, uh, and actually simply run them, right? So in the standard example, which of course I won't get around showing you, is any guesses from that corner there? Yeah. As to what? As to what the standard example that people tend to show. Um, uh, what kind of Docker is now you run? Yep. Oh, that's a good one as well. True. Yeah, Apache was also on my uh, my playlist, but I thought more about the Hello World thing. Anyway, um, so I installed uh, Docker already, so I, um, you know, it's no point us waiting and hoping that my machine actually installs it. So I did it before, but the commands are basically set out there. But the the the, the fundamental functionality is as simple as running. Um, well, let's let's do Docker search and then Hello. Let's see how we get out of there you go. So what you can run, so I ran the command, I ran right just now was sudo docker search hello. Because I want you to look for a hello world application and you'll see, oops, there's more than one. Well, there is, because it's pretty much um, using um, a kind of a Play Store concept in that every user can possibly submit his or her own containers, right? And make it accessible for all others. Yeah, think about it a little, a little bit like a, a um, um, it's um, <coughs> a, a service which is like the equivalent to GitHub for software developers is here for, for Docker. And this is something you can use. Of course, you have the more official ones, uh, but also you have a lot of unofficial uh, containers there um, that, that uh, you find. And the ones that are official are no, um, you know, indicated by this tag here, being official. The rest is you know, whatever you provide. So you're at risk running download uh, you know, some other person's Bitcoin miner onto your uh, container environment. So be a bit mindful there, so you want to keep an eye on this. But fundamentally, that's the idea, right? So once you identify a um, image of choice, it will download it. Uh, usually, it will apply the tag latest. And um, the idea about the tag is that you can actually version different images. So if you um, look at images, um, you'll find that they actually come in different uh, you know, versions. Because of course, I mentioned before, there's this commit concept. You could do iterative changes or adapt it to new versions of operating systems. Again, recall that it to some extent depend on the underlying operating system. So if you're switching to a from um, Ubuntu 16.04 LTS to 18.04 LTS, for example, you may need to check whether your Docker build actually still works properly. Or at least then, uh, once you have validated this, adjust the version number of Ubuntu you want to use in your, in your Docker build. We get to that. So, but by default, it will always pull the latest one um, that's available. Cool. So now we have an image down there, and we can run something like sudo docker images. That shows us all the images that are installed. And if you see uh, here, probably expand this a bit to get a, avoid the line break if that if that, if that works. But uh, so there you go. Um, we see we have a um, repository you downloaded uh, Hello World, and it has some sort of ID. That's the actual unique identifier, and of course the size. So we see. We're basically running it or having our own application here that has a size of 1.84 kilobyte, which is rather small. So that's, I think it's quite obvious that there's an immediate um, uh, benefit of, you know, well, it's not much in there really. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm reluctant to, to say too much about benefits here, but um, it can be quite, they can be quite small, those images. So that's the standard uh, Docker run hello world. And it basically just say, yeah, cool, it works. And that's actually quite helpful to run as a, a debug mechanism to ensure that your installation does what it's supposed to do. Again, they remember Docker relies on a lot of underlying operating system functionality and there can sometimes be configuration issues. So I encourage you to just run sudo docker run hello world uh, once you do the, um, actual, um, the actual setup. So yeah, 
So that's um, one of the points I um, um, wanted to make. Um, yeah. So do, is there anything running now? Docker PS. So there's nothing running. Cool. So there was a container that basically just executed and pointed me to the docs, and that was roughly it. So it's not like super, um, you know, interesting to see what's going on there. But um, I'll briefly want to show you that mysterious source of uh, all images. Ah, I don't have internet. I do have internet. I have slow internet. Good. Better slow than no internet. We get there. So, um, yeah, MariaDB, for example. Cool. <laughs> so, um, and how it happens, so is um, there's the Docker Store and there's the Docker Hub. Um, And that's basically uh, sources you can explore and uh, say, okay, I actually want to see, you know, let's type Apache in because you guys said it. Um, and you see, okay, what, what kind of repositories are actually available? So those are fully fledged installations of uh, for Apache, the web server in this case. Right here you see, oh, many of, most of them are of course public, but there's also the official one, right? So that seems to be the one that's uh, properly supported. And what do we get here? So um, basically a documentation of how to run it. And we also get a pointer to Docker files. We get to those in a uh, uh, very second. So um, <coughs> yeah, so it's basically look like a like a like a readme page on a GitHub, um, um, you know, uh, repository, which you can basically uh, customize to to your needs. But generally, it's along the lines: okay, that's what's supported, that's what's required, and that's how you run it, right? So um, that's that's the key idea here. So it basically provides you with all the information you need to, for example, get it to run. So uh, if you <coughs> but it fundamentally starts off every time you do something and you run docker builds, if you read here for example, it r uh, starts off with looking at some something like a docker file. And it's probably quite good just to briefly have a skim at it of what a docker file actually is. So if you run your own Apache environment, um, of course you can run up get and everything is done for you. But um, especially if you set up as a tad more complicated or you want to use advanced features or want to combine it with uh, other services and so on, then it becomes a bit more challenging. And that's precisely what the Docker file is about. It basically tells you, okay, I want to start from a base image. Um, so you could easily also write here, instead of Debian here right now, Ubuntu latest, so the latest Ubuntu. Um, you're setting some sort of environment variables so that you know from um, Linux already, from Bash, that you, you know, like go root and go path and things like this. Similar thing, you basically set them and they will apply within that very image. Then you execute something. So in this case, you are, uh, uh, it's making a directory and changing the uh, permission set on it and changing the work directory. And again, setting another some um, environment uh, variables and then running something. In this case, actually, if I get it right here, hang on, downloading something uh, directly. And afterwards, it's installing uh, something using apt-get update. And the following libraries will install it sets with the environment variables, blah, 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 blah. So a lot of stuff that's actually done doing installation and set up, right? But the idea here, instead of you going around and setting up manually or writing a bash script that fits to your operating system, your configuration, use that thing, run it on any sort of Linux operating system, whether it's actually Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, or Slack, where you name it, as long as it runs Docker, it should be kind of able, and being a Linux, um, should be able to basically run, compile this file and run it in one go. And you don't need to care about deployment. And that's the point. You may think, okay, cool, that's for sysadmins. Why am I doing this? But the point is, at this stage, I'm not sure if you actually need a sysadmin to run this thing anymore, right? So it's something you can spin up, especially if you want to test something, but also if you want to test your deployment, right? And it makes your description of how to deploy things, something we will require in your submissions, a readme telling me, okay, how do you run your code? Very explicit because you specified, for example, in a Docker file, and there's actually no questions asked as to how to deploy, deploy because we can test it whether it works, and you as well. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the key ideas. Um, okay, I will not go into uh, greater details here, and it's of course uh, moving um, uh, along here a bit too fast than otherwise. Um, but I have another resource video that I will provide you with uh, where I talk about those aspects in um, greater detail. But um, just to, to motivate the simplicity, I guess, one of the f my, my favorites, which is actually kind of a pain to set up otherwise, um, is, um, let's see if they, 
yeah, it's this one here. So it's kind of a monitoring solution, um, um, you know, f about your machine, your host you're currently running on, but also you can easily distribute and monitor other hosts in your network. Uh, and it's actually a bit, bit tedious to, to actually uh, configure and set up. Um, so if you do it from, from, from scratch, you actually spend quite some time for, uh, doing so. Um, but it's, it can be quite easy to actually do it in, in, in a Docker context then, right? So if we say um, Docker run, the only thing that doesn't work so well is typing that out. So, did I miss anything? Yes, I missed a lot. Of course, I do. Um, I need to pull the image, of course, first. And this is, a, you know, very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive thing that has a lot of uh, functionality. Afterwards, I need to run this. But before that, see what's happening here. Um, so when I ran Docker pull and then trigger this particular image which has been built and is provided, um, it actually did multiple downloads, right? So it's, it's sliced up into, you know, individual slices that are then downloaded individually and recombined into some image afterwards. Of course, the advantage is firstly to be able to parallelize the download, but secondly also to have partial downloads. Assuming you're downloading an image that's one or two gigabyte and you lose internet connectivity and you kind of need to restart again. That is not cool, so that's why the idea of, 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 of slicing to some extent. So if we now run sudo docker images here, you see, oh cool, there's a new repository there, latest, but you see the size is considerable, 267 megabyte. It's big for a docker image-ish, but small for an operating system, right? So if you compare to the original virtualization solution, that's kind of nothing. So, um, so of course, then you need to rely to some extent on the documentation to actually run stuff. So in this this example here, um, so it will run. Um, um, it will, um, yeah, basically map some uh, volumes of the host operating system to to the uh, NetDecker service. For example, it wants to make the pro the proc file system accessible. What does the proc file system do on a Linux operating system? The proc folder. Does anyone remember? Sys admins, please. None here. Yeah? Basically, yeah, sorry, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's been pretty much like a process, the task manager in Windows. It shows you all the tasks, right? Then the process is attached to it, and that's precisely what's happening in proc uh, directly on the host. And this thing, since it monitors your own local machine, it kind of needs access, access to the local machine. That's why I need to map it. Again, I'll talk about this more afterwards. And this, that's the dash V, and the dash P here, that's the um, interesting one, is about um, port mapping. So the question is there, you recall, and that's where networking comes in, back into play. We uh, talked about networking, um, that we have uh, 65K ports on a given host, right? So what's the key idea here? But you still need to tell the system now, which Docker container gets which port, right? So we could have multiple web server Docker containers that all run port 80. Yeah, it's not gonna happen, right? So they can't all bind to port 80, so you kind of need to redirect them. It's a bit like the port forwarding idea that we talked about in the context of networking, but now internal to a host, right? The host gets a, a message and needs to redirect internally to one of the containers. And here the default is basically picked as being 19,999. Um, okay, so I just run this thing and then uh, I'll um, delegate the rest to other resources, so let's see if that goes. Oh yeah, that worked well. So basically what I did, it copied and pasted, so as simple as that, of course with sudo, that command from, from the corresponding repository and ran this thing. So if you then now run sudo docker ps, so first I ran sudo docker images, again that's the raw image, the template, it does not executed. that's what you can instantiate from. Now I ran uh, sudo docker ps, and that shows actually what's running, what container is currently running. And it also shows you the start parameters, which is quite, quite helpful, right? So we know the image is running, the command that's internally running right now, you don't need to care about this too much, but if you wrote your own Docker container, you want to care what actually has been invoked, um, when it was created, and, and, and so on, and also the port mapping, right? So this said, from any call on any interface on my host, on port 19,999, redirect to the Docker container on the same port. Now, if you don't do that, you will not get network connectivity in that container. And then uh, it, yeah, Docker attaches a cute auto-generated name, so you can easily reference uh, your running instance, as opposed to dealing with, uh, yeah, this here, for example. The container ID is kind of not super, uh, you know, expressive. Cool. Um, and of course, you would want to be able to access it. So in this case now, 
the only thing you need to know uh, is of course where you ran it um, and I ran this thing hang on on a actual virtual machine on OpenStack so in this case which IP do you need to use to get access to it which IP do I need to use to get access to it um, now if I want to access that service that I just installed on port 19,999 if I run it from the same thing yes but now from externally which IP would matter that's what I want to get at. Cool, cheers, thank you. Exactly. So you need to use the floating IP of the instance that you created. So here's my open stack overview, and I create this Docker instance, which I spun up a few days ago, and it has this floating IP. And this is one that is mapped, you know, this is the host now, this is mapped internally against um, the container. Okay, cool, thank you. So, So, you know, as simple as that. So something that would otherwise take you kind of some time to actually set up um, in terms of, you know, <coughs> the database for logging and so on, uh, CPU information and so on. That's, that's the simplicity you can do it and suddenly you have the whole system sp spun up and running. And of course, this can be arbitrarily complex. You guys did it for multiple services across different containers that are interacting using Docker Swarm. We're not going that far, but we still look at Docker Compose, hopefully. Um, um, so that's that's the key idea here. So making deployment easy, right? So uh, one of the key um, thoughts that we have here. So I will not go further into this, otherwise I use the entire session up. I want to really dedicate the rest of the session to uh, you know support of uh, individuals that are still struggling with stuff respect uh, related to the assignment. Are there still individuals that struggle with the assignment? Ah, uh, yeah, good, good, good. So okay, how, uh, good. How many of those individuals have not given up yet? Good. Don't give up. Uh, up, uh, giving up is not an option in this course, you know that, right? So, else we come to your home and, you know. So anyway, no, um, the, the uh, idea is, even if you don't have anything complete uh, in your assignment, just submit it, you get partial marks, yeah? So if you feel like, oh, I didn't really quite make it and I don't want to be bothered submitting it um, for whatever reason, still submit it, please, um, because, you know, it's still a starting point. So also, um, it's relevant for the second assignment. So there were some comments on the second assignment in, um, in the um, um, issue tracker and so on, the, uh, there would be some clarifications on that one on Tuesday. So because of course it gets kind of pressing and it was still a kind of a raw prototype-ish, uh, um, skeleton-ish um, uh, structure there. So um, that will be refined, so you have a bit more to work off. But what you should immediately see is that it's related to the same domain, again, this IGC information data. So everything you build right now in the first assignment, we can, of course, reuse for the second assignment. So it's, a, it's kind of an investment, if you like, if you do the first assignment, that you kind of can reuse most of that functionality quite immediately. So uh, yeah, I'll just come around and help you individually in a second. Um, OK, that was a bit rough on Docker, admittedly. Um, so it was not really, really uh, uh, comprehensive all of you. But I still want to put in a, uh, some resources that I would ask you to look at um, uh, in terms of videos that complement the rest of it. What you, how you run, of course, images, but also how you build images. Both uh, two ways. One of them is interactive, where you actually build them by you know, actually running the commands yourself and recording them. And the other way is writing those Docker files, which you just skimmed through, uh, and so on. Um, and some, some structural aspects of it. Um, but again, this will come via the um, um, GitHub, GitLab uh, wiki, but for now I leave it at that. Did any, everyone get some sort of an idea of what I talked about? Yes. Sort of, yeah? At least one intuition, there's a container, VM is different, and we play with this, and cool. So that's roughly what I get across in this session, otherwise um, um, that yeah, would not be necessary.